and welcome to part two of the Insonic Mirage HXC floppy drive emulator series. I really need to do something about that title. In part one, I gave a rundown of the emulator's compatibility and functionality with the Mirage, so if you haven't seen that yet, I would suggest starting there. In this video, I will be going through the process of installing the emulator into the sampler. Before I get started, however, I feel I should make another disclaimer. The Mirage is a potentially fragile system, the early models of which are now over 30 years old. Any modifications you make to the machine, you have to do at your own risk, and I am not responsible for any damage the Mirage might sustain from them. If you are not comfortable performing these modifications yourself, consider having someone more tech-savvy do them for you. With that out of the way, there are a couple tools that we'll need for the installation. A 2.5mm hex slash allen key, a Phillips head screwdriver, a small electronic screwdriver, and possibly a multimeter for testing the power supply cable if necessary. There will be more on that later. There are four different models of the Mirage. The DSK-1 with its black metal case, the DSK-8 in fetching gray metal, the black DSK-8 living in the plastic age, and the DMS-8 rack mount model. Luckily, in the case of the keyboard versions, it is not necessary to remove the keybed in order to access the floppy drive, unlike the Octophonic modification. We'll start with the black DSK-1 and gray DSK-8 metallic keyboard models. Start by removing the Allen head screws from the front panel of the machine. There are usually five, one at each corner and one at the top right corner of the control wheel plate. The top panel can then hinge open. With the top panel open, you should now have access to the back of the floppy drive. Disconnect the power cable and ribbon cable, noting their orientation, and then close the front panel. Flip the Mirage over and rest it on a softer supportive surface so as not to damage the volume control slider or the front panel buttons. I recommend a thick towel or blanket for this. There are four Phillips head screws securing the floppy drive to the underside of the machine. Remove them and then pull the drive out through the front. The plastic DSK-8 model is slightly different. Remove the four hex head screws at each corner of the top lid and then open it. You may need to apply a small amount of force to get it open as the plastic is flexible and tightly fit into the case. After removing the four Allen head screws from the front panel, again flip the machine over and rest it on a soft surface. Remove the two Phillips head screws at the bottom right of the case attached to the control panel, as well as the two at the top right underneath the back overhang. This should allow the control panel unit with the floppy drive to lift free, giving you access to the drive. Be mindful of any zip ties or wire ties holding the control panel wires in place. Note the orientation of the ribbon cable and power cable, and then remove them. Finally, remove the two Phillips head screws from either side of the floppy drive mounts. You should now be able to remove the drive from the unit. The rack mounted DMS-8 is a much simpler operation. Simply remove the hex screws from the either side of the unit as well as the six on top. The top of the unit should now easily lift free. Remove the ribbon cable and power supply cable from the back of the floppy drive, noting their orientation, and then note the yellow colored floppy drive standoff underneath the drive. Flip the Mirage over and remove the four screws securing this to the case while supporting the drive, and then remove the screws securing the drive itself to the standoff. Now that we have the Mirage disassembled, we can focus on the installation. The installation is relatively easy. Provided you purchased revision F of the emulator, the holes on the emulator case should match up one to one with the holes of the original floppy drive. Simply reuse the mounting screws from the original drive and mount the emulator in the same spot. For the metal case keyboard models, you may find it easier to thread the ribbon cable and power cable through the front of the case first, attach them to the emulator, and then secure the emulator inside the case. When connecting the ribbon and power cables, it's important to note that the cables may not install the same way on the emulator that they did on the original drive. In the case of my DMS-8 rack model under Vision F emulator, the ribbon and power cables both mounted upside down on the emulator. This may not be the case for all emulator revisions, but while there is no orientation indicator for the ribbon cable other than the red power line, the power cable connector is designed to be installed only in one direction. If you are encountering resistance while installing the power connector, try flipping it over. Typically, if the power connector is installed upside down, the ribbon cable will be installed upside down as well. If you are still unsure about the correct orientation of your power connector, you can use a multimeter to test the DC voltage outputs of the connector pins. The Mirage service manual gives a detailed diagram of what each of these pins should output, and the emulator manual clearly marks which pins receive which voltage. The emulator will not make use of the 12 volt output pin on the power connector coming from the PSU, instead sending it to one of the ground pins on the emulator power header. The final portion of the installation involves the drive identification for the operating system. This sounds a lot more complicated than it actually is. 
The Mirage uses a drive that is identified as drive A on ID0. So in our case, we need to move the DIP micro switch for ID0A to on or connect their proper jumpers for the same setting, depending on your emulator model. Also, depending on the size of the original drive, there may be a small gap between the emulator case and the surrounding metal of the Mirage. There are a number of creative ways to solve this issue if you're good at working with plastic or metal, but I just covered mine with electrical tape. With the emulator installed into the Mirage, we can now conclude part two of the series. In the final video, we'll be using the included HXC software to configure the emulator behavior, as well as some third-party software to rip Mirage disk images and convert them to the file format used by the emulator. I hope you found this video helpful. You can find part one of the series here, or you can hear a sample of my music here at the other link. Thanks for watching and please stay tuned for part three.